All right, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 5. This has been a, it's been a heavy week in a lot of ways. I think for many of you, I know stories that are going on right now that has made this a heavy week in a lot of ways. And I just want to pause and thank God for his grace because I don't know a better passage to dive into if this has been a, a, rough, a rough week for you. So we're beginning our series today on Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know of a more, um, I, mean, I don't know if I know of a more intimidating passage to preach than to preach on the preaching of Jesus. It feels a little silly in some ways. It feels like I'm going to listen to a sermon of Jesus and then we're going to sit down and critique it. And that's a strange place to be in, to say, okay, well, what, is, what does he mean by all of these things? And so um, it is, um, it, it's this dual feeling. And I even, I texted uh, Robbie and, and Jeff Clossy this morning just saying, because they knew before leading up to this, like the, the excitement, anticipation of preaching this series. And I just said, I am, I am both really excited for this message and terrified because it is just so big. And so like the refrain in my mind as I've been writing this and preparing this is don't mess it up. Just don't mess it up. Just like these are the words of Jesus preaching, like just don't mess it up. And so that's my aim today. So if you're hoping for a home run sermon, I am just trying not to look like a fool at the plate and swing and miss wildly and fall on my face. There's still a good chance I will do that, but I guess I get three strikes. So we'll see what happens. Um, and so in doing that, I both know that there's going to be some weeds that we're going to get into because there's mystery in this sermon. This is like the most, this is the most contained and clear picture we have of, of just a set of Jesus' teachings. And yet when you read scholars and pastors, they, they, there is um, debate among different things. And we can get lost in the weeds. And there are some things that we might get a little lost in the weeds. But I want to make sure that there's... there's Big picture ideas kind of setting the lens. So I want to make sure that, that uh, if nothing else, I'm able to give you a lens through which to, to read these and to commune with Jesus through them. And I want to make sure that we understand some things about these, the, the first section here, the Beatitudes. That, that we understand that what's happening here is this is the introduction to, to a sermon that Jesus is giving that is defining what the kingdom of God looks like compared to the kingdom of the world. That the people had a view of what the world looks like and even what the religious world looks like and even how the kingdom of God should look on earth. And Jesus is defining what that looks like. He's setting, that, setting out like a picture of this is the kingdom. And this is how the citizens of the kingdom function. And he's confronting that. He's confronting with the, as the kingdom comes to earth, he physically is confronting that by coming, becoming flesh and walking among them, but now through his words. And so it's important to know that the Beatitudes, this first section, is kind of an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. It is not a list of new righteous requirements. It's not a checklist of things that like, okay, I have to become more poor in spirit. I have to grieve more. I have to be more, um, I have to be more mournful. I have, to, I have to hunger and thirst for righteousness more. It's not a list of new things and new law that you have to, uh, to, to do in order to attain the kingdom. And it is not simply a foretelling of what, the heaven, uh, what heaven will be like. It is also not meant to be received as just kind of this lump teaching of saying like, well, wouldn't that be nice? That's what it'll be like someday. But today, obviously, that's not happening. So it's not something that we can take as a law and a checklist to work our way into the kingdom. And it's also not something that we can just package up and set aside and dismiss as kind of a pie in the sky, someday type of thing. So there's a tension. I believe that as Jesus communicating with the crowds around him to tell them the kingdom of God is at hand and it is available to everyone. 
And the, the kingdom of God functions differently than the kingdom of the world. And in fact, the people that you might see as least worthy for the kingdom are the ones who will actually inherit it. There is an already not yet feel to it. So it's not just this thing out there someday, and it's not just this thing that we're supposed to work for here today. There is an already not yet feel to the kingdom of God. It is both here and can be experienced here, and it is still to come. In a similar type of passage, talking about the nature of the love of God manifested in his people, Paul says, in the very famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So I believe that is helpful in the lens through which we read this. We see things, we'll see some of the things that we're talking about here, some of the rewards and some of the the results of that being manifested here now, but through a mere dimly. And that there is a day that will come that will be fully known. So in short, or maybe not so short, I would say that it is meant to be two main things. And I say I believe it is. Because I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna claim and, and just trust in Christ and say that... Um, that, well, basically say, I am being as faithful as I can here to the text. And so I believe that it is meant to be, one, a confrontation of the world. So this is the lens. One is a confrontation of the world, both out there, the kingdom of the world out there, and the kingdom of the world that fights for our own hearts in here. So one, it is a confrontation of the world. And second, it is meant to be a comfort and an encouragement to those who are a part of the kingdom, that it is worth it and that the reward is great. So it should be read, I think, as a confrontation, as a litmus, as a question to ourselves. What kingdom am I a part of? Which kingdom is, is mine do I claim? And which king do I claim? Am I a part of the kingdom of heaven where Jesus is king and ruler and Lord? Or am I a part of the kingdom of the world in which I rule, in which I am king, and where what I think makes sense is what is right. So it is meant to do that and it is meant to be a comfort that that yes, like if you pursue that, that it's going to talk about things that we don't really want to be. We don't want to be poor in spirit. We don't want to mourn, right? We don't want to hunger and thirst. Like these are not um, worldly positive things. And so it's meant to be a comfort and encouragement for those who are in those states that it's worth it, that the kingdom is at hand and your your reward is great. To know that he sees you. He knows what you are going through. And that things will be made right and then some. And don't worry. The plan was for the intro of this message to be half of the message. So if you're wondering, like, are you still in the intro? Yes, I am. But it's, it's the, in fairness, it's the intro to the whole series, okay? And then the second half of it will be just kind of the, the actual Beatitudes, we're just going to kind of go rapid fire on. So it, it is this confrontation. Where do I get that? It, it's the kingdom of God is countercultural, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. It doesn't, the kingdom of God does not make sense to the world because it is not of this world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So the kingdom of God, first of all, from that passage, one of the things that's important when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, he is talking about what he's referring to here in John 18 as his kingdom. This is important. This kingdom belongs to Jesus. It is his kingdom. And so laying hold to his kingdom only comes through him. 
He is the way and the truth and the life. This is what protects us from saying, oh, well, what really matters, what Jesus really taught was just to be more humble, to be more kind, to be more loving. And that's really what he wants. Well, no, what he's saying is that the kingdom comes through him. He is the way, the truth, and life. It is his kingdom. There's no state of God's kingdom where Jesus is not king, where he is not Lord. The states of being and the Beatitudes are not ways to go about getting the kingdom of God apart from Jesus. It is his. It is not of this world. It has invaded the world. And because that's the case, it doesn't make sense to the world. So the fact that the kingdom does not make sense to the world makes perfect sense. You tracking? Like it makes sense that it doesn't make sense. Why would it make sense? The kingdom is not of this world. This world's kingdom has been so infected and intertwined by the fall and by sin that things that look good are actually evil. Evil things look good to us. We all have stories like that. We all have things in our life that we could look back on. And we have now in hindsight looked and thought, why did I see that as good? Why did I look at that and see that as desirable? And now you look back and you think, what was I thinking? That's this in a much bigger picture. The way of Jesus, of course, is not going to make sense in a kingdom that has been built on sin. So it's his. And you have to realize that that is going to be the case. The world is is not just alive and well out there, but it is battling then for your heart and your mind in here. And you will read the Sermon on the Mount sometimes. There will be a voice in your head and you will hear that voice to say, well, yeah, okay, he says that, but that doesn't mean this. Like, let's not go crazy with this. Surely God doesn't expect this. Like, yeah, I know he says, you know, if, if someone takes from you, like, don't expect repayment or give them extra. Like, I know, I know he says that, but that, like, surely that can't be the case. What does that sound like? The serpent said to the woman, you'll not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so we see things in the Sermon on the Mount and say, well, surely it doesn't mean this because then, well, that would mean that like we would, um, we would lose ground in the, in the morality wars and the culture wars. We'd lose ground over here and we would, someone might think we actually condone this. Like, so surely God doesn't want us to function in that way. And every time I hear things like that, I hear the serpent in the garden saying, well, surely you won't die. This is actually a good thing. You want wisdom. You want knowledge, like those are good things. So surely you're not going to die. You'll, you'll just be more like God. So it won't, we'll just kind of taper those things or temper them and dismiss them or change them and translate them. If you love Jesus, if you've committed your life to following him, if you belong to him, then my plea to you as you read this is listen to his voice. Do not be afraid. Trust him. The kingdom of heaven is worth it. It is already here and it is yet to come even in greater glory. And so do not listen to the voice that would seek to dismiss these things. Do not listen to the voice that would seek to turn these into a law by which you could feel self-righteous. But rather just trust him and hear his voice. So it's a confrontation and it's a comfort. So Jesus is not merely just saying, okay, the kingdom of heaven does not make sense in the kingdom of the world, so it's going to be awful for you for a little bit, but don't worry, it'll be over soon. It's not that. There's actually a comfort that happens. There's a reward that happens. He brings comfort to the people who thought they were excluded from the kingdom by flipping their state upside down, which makes sense because it's the upside down kingdom. So all things are made right. He's telling them like, hey, all things are going to be made right. But more than that, they're going to be amplified in joy. Now here's probably the the most difficult theological thing that I'm going to talk about today. 
And I say that because it's something I've been wrestling with and it is a mystery to me. So I, I'm already knowing I cannot explain this perfectly, which is already starting behind the eight ball. But Jesus doesn't just in these, doesn't just say, hey, hang in there. I know that this is painful, but that's going to be taken away at some point. He's not just removing a negative state. He's actually resurrecting those lowly states into something that is exalted. So he doesn't just get you back to square one, kind of like um, you're in pain, and so like, oh, you're hurting right now. Don't worry, that pain's going to be taken away. It's more like one of the dumb analogies that popped in my head to try to, to communicate this was like, it's the difference between just sitting there and feeling pain in your leg versus like if you go and you work out and you feel pain. So if you decide to get off of the couch and go to the gym and work out, you don't feel physically better when you're done with that workout than you did if you were sitting on the couch. Like I don't care what people say, no, it feels good. It only feels good because of what you know is happening in you, right? That's the only reason it feels good, unless you're a sadist and you're like, oh, I love it that I can't walk right now. I love it I can't breathe, right? You're more comfortable, you'd be better off, you'd be more comfortable just staying on the couch. But what we'd say is, no, blessed is the one whose muscles hurt at the end of the workout because something better is coming, something better than your previous state. He resurrects things. Think about the, the resurrection, like the core of our faith. What is accomplished in that? He says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory. Death is defeated. What does that mean? It doesn't mean avoided. It doesn't mean just removed. It means defeated and resurrected as life. This is very different than like say the, the fountain of youth that has always been a thing in, in mythology throughout human history. The fountain of youth is a, is a means to avoid death, to run around death, to try to, to evade death. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the defeat of death. It has no sting. It has no power. It is defeated. There's a reason for the resurrection. Jesus could have just lived forever and ascended. He could have done that, but he doesn't. Why? Because death was defeated, not avoided. It's defeated. Its power is only robbed through being defeated. And it becomes then a servant by being resurrected and flipped as life. And what is life? Life is the opposite of death. We would never say that a rock is immortal. A rock doesn't die, but that doesn't make it immortal. That doesn't make it alive. It is when those that go through death are resurrected into life so that death is defeated, that is a different level of life. So, so death is defeated in the resurrection. Sin is defeated in the resurrection. Heaven is not just the absence of sin, but it's flipped into righteousness. You see this all the way through scripture. Sorrow turns to joy. Grieving turns to rejoicing. Suffering turns to abundant life. Pain turns to flourishing. The least become the greatest. It's not just a removal of it. It's not looking at the least and saying, hey, don't worry. One day you'll be on the same plane as everybody else. He says, you know, you'll be great. The promise of the kingdom is that in part, your reward or what we receive is flipped upside down from what we are going through. Why, why is this important? Think about who he's talking to. 
He's talking to the crowds, and at this point, those crowds are made up of many people who have been rejected, who are seen as, in, as not having value. They are the poor, the lame, the sick, the outcast. And what Jesus is saying to them is they're following him around and hearing his teachings, and he's saying the kingdom of God is for you. But they're going to be wondering then questions of like, well, if the kingdom of God is for me, then why can't I see? Why did my child die? Why is this my state? They would have believed that all of those things were evidence that God did not see them, did not love them, did not care about them, or that he was not good. And so Jesus is not just merely saying like, hey, don't worry, hang in there. It'll, eventually this will be removed. He's saying, no, no, no. God is so good that the least of you will become great. That no hurt that you experience here on earth is wasted in the resurrection. It's resurrected into something even more beautiful than you could have imagined. And that state is far greater than if you had never had that pain. This is a mystery. And he clearly is not answering all of the questions about this. But what he is doing is making a promise. This is the kingdom. And the question is, do you believe him? So in part, he's answering that question. And they say, has he forgotten about me? Is he cruel? Am I just that evil and that bad that all these things have happened to me? They're asking it of themselves and others would say it about them. But he's saying, no, the latter state is better than if the first state had never existed. The last shall be first. The least will be the greatest. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And Peter said in reply, See, we've left everything and followed you. This is part of this idea that you were given the kingdom, and it's even better. And I love this. When Peter's telling Jesus, like, look, we've left everything to follow you. What will we get then? If He's hearing all this stuff. He's hearing this in verse. He's like, holy cow. Like, well, if that's the case... Then, then how awesome is it going to be for us? And Jesus says to him, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. I feel like every time I quote this passage, I say, I don't 100% know what that means. So let me take the opportunity this time to tell you, I don't really know what this passage means. What I do know is that this is part of this theme of he just keeps inversing things and flipping them upside down, and he keeps saying, and it's all through scripture, by the way, read Job. Job's last state is better than his first as if he had never participated or experienced any of the suffering that he experiences. And so what we see over and over and over again is Jesus saying, you haven't given up anything. Whatever suffering you face here on earth will be repaid in joy by a factor of 10, 100, and more. That is the power of the gospel. See, the world can give you ways to deal with your present situation and manage the effects. It's good to, be, to mourn and be comforted. And that is a good process, apart, even apart from Jesus. People of the world know that it's good to express your emotions and to be comforted in that. But the difference is that it's only in Jesus that your mourning will be resurrected into joy. That the grief over even the loss of your child be resurrected into joy. Not just the removal of that grief. And both here and now and in the age to come. Already, but not yet. They're both something that we experience now in part, but we also look forward to the day when it will be fulfilled completely in a way that is beyond our comprehension. So be challenged by these and confronted by them and then Be comforted that if you belong to the kingdom, or more acutely, if you belong to the king, then this is your reward. 
and is infinitely better than just the removal of the brokenness of the world. So rapid fire. It's going to be really rapid fire now. That's okay. It's more important to give you a lens. Go home and read these and just let it soak over you. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This poor of spirit, this idea of being contrite and humble and feeling conviction over our sin. That is a difficult state, right? Anybody ever feel conviction over sin and, and find that to be a difficult state to be in? Nobody? All right, well then, amen, go home. I don't know. I don't know for me, like to confront sin, when somebody confronts me with sin and I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, like, that is true. Like, it hurts. It hurts. And so no wonder the world does everything they can to avoid it, to avoid feeling spiritually needy, to avoid feeling conviction over sin. And so we do all kinds of things to avoid that. I don't don't want to feel that way. And so we affirm ourselves and we tell ourselves how we're basically, we're pretty much a good person. We excuse our sin by saying like anybody in our situation would have done it. We justify our sin by saying, yes, but that person responded to me in this way. If they weren't doing that, then I wouldn't do this. We say that we are strong and that we are good, but Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, you're blessed if you're poor in spirit. Why? Because you receive the kingdom. You feel that conviction, you walk into that, and you cling to Jesus in the midst of it, and you receive this. Those who know they are sick need a doctor and will be healed. Those who'd prefer to ignore their illness and think themselves well will die in their arrogance. So he asks us when he confronts this, and we say, like, no, I I wanna I wanna be that, like that's what a kingdom citizen looks like. Are you quick to admit fault? Or do you want the other person to admit fault first? Are you quick to confess or are you quick to defend? I would say, do not be your own defender. If you are in Christ, if you are part of the kingdom, you have a defender, and that defender died so that you might live. And so if you are here and you're feeling like, well, look, I am poor in spirit. I am spiritually needy. I look around. I think everybody else has it together, but I don't. Listen, if you don't feel, like if you feel that way, if you don't feel like you're good enough, if you feel like you don't measure up, if you look around and you say, I'm not as religious as the other people, then be comforted. Because if you look to Christ in that, yours is the kingdom of heaven. You are home. He says, blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. If you mourn, he's talking to this crowd. He's like, if you, those of you who are mourning, think about all the suffering and the grief that they were dealing with. He's saying, you will be comforted. All things will be made right. We mourn over our own sin and we mourn over the brokenness of the world. And Jesus says that you are blessed when you mourn. Again, like this is this idea of resurrection of this. He's not saying like it'll be okay if you mourn because someday that reason for mourning will be gone. He's saying, no, you're blessed when you mourn for you'll be comforted. And so what he's offering there evidently is that that state of being comforted is better than if you had never mourned. Because if you never mourn, then you never experience the comfort of God. The world tries to live that way. It confronts the way of the world. The Buddhist says do not get attached to anything so then you don't You don't have to mourn. You don't have to grieve. That's the secret to to happiness. Just don't be attached to anything. The survivalist says you have to harden yourself because the world is tough. And so you have to harden yourself. Don't give yourself over to mourning. But Jesus offers something better. The comfort is not just a removal or numbing of the grief. This is kingdom comfort, which turns mourning into joy. Jesus says in John 16, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. There it is again. It does not say your sorrow will be removed, so you won't be sad anymore. He says it will be resurrected. It will turn into joy. 
He goes on to mention childbirth in that passage, by the way, in John 16, just like a man trying to make a parallel to talking about childbirth. But a healthy childbirth is a great picture. Like that pain that exists, like my understanding is that there's no pain quite like childbirth. And yet, what do people talk about when a healthy baby is born? The joy of holding the baby. The pain is like, this is, this is worth it. And all of that, holding the baby, is worth far more than just being in a state of no connection like that. And even those, as we mentioned, have mourned the loss of a child or mourn un- being, being unable to have a child, you will be comforted. You get a taste of that comfort from Jesus here and now, and one day it will come in fullness, and it'll be far greater than if you had never mourned. And it's a mystery, but just because it's a mystery doesn't mean it isn't true. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The world has a different way for inheriting the earth, laying claim to the earth. We have to fight, spread, and then even in the religious sector, in churches, it, it, gets, it ekes its way in the world's way. We have to take it by force. We have to force our way onto people like the colonialism. We must fight and spread the kingdom by force. And so even in the church, sometimes we'll say, well, if you can't win culture, the hearts of people in the culture, then we'll just force them to act the right way. And that'll be good enough. That is not the kingdom. It is not the kingdom. It's not how the kingdom will come on earth. The earth is given to those who are meek, not those who do power grabs or try to be noticed, but those who seek the lower seat, those who count others as more significant than themselves, those who trust that the earth and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. And they belong to the Lord. And so they live for his good pleasure. By the way, there's a counterfeit version of this, and it's the person who serves others because they are, they're meek, but it's that they're filling a need in themselves. These are all faulty versions, just stained by sin. And so the world deals with that too, like, oh, no, 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 we love meek and meekness and, and humility and serving others and everything. But, but then there comes a limit to that, and so at some point, you've got to put yourself first. The world will always resort back to, but you have to serve yourself. But the gospel says, no, Christ has become your servant. And he fulfills your every desire. He is your identity. And so that frees you to say yes and to say no and to not need the praises of others and need to be seen as meek and a servant, but rather to just delight in the Lord in your service. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. God makes all things right. When I mean, you think about that, that term, hunger and thirst for something, and like the satisfaction of being filled, right? Like if you've ever been in that situation, most, most of us don't know what it's like to be truly hungry or truly thirsty. I mean, I, I can think of examples. I know like um, I've had situations in like, um, you know, one time I rode a bike for like three miles and my body started to shut down. Um, it was more than three miles, right? Just, just to be fair. Um, but there was that feeling of like, I just, I have to have water. There's a, there's a, there's a time in which you switch over from like, I'm really thirsty to like, I thirst. I have to have something to drink. I need something to eat. And that is how we're called to desire righteousness. That's a, and Jesus is saying, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you look around the world and you see the brokenness and you say, this, this doesn't seem right, this doesn't seem fair, this doesn't seem just, if you, if you hunger for that, for you and for others, and you see that, then know that you will be filled. But not in your own strength. In the kingdom, you're filled. And again, the world deals with that in one of a couple ways. They say, yes, no, I hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so I'm going to go lay hold to that. I'm going to make people be, give justice. I'm going to force people to act righteously. And we're going to get all that for everybody. But that never works out. 
God makes everything right. There's only one way for this to be satisfied. But we're also called, though, to still hunger and thirst for it. Like, that's what kingdom citizens do. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we're blessed because someday we'll see that come to fruition. So we don't ignore the plight of the oppressed. We don't ignore those who are struggling or suffering or those who are are held down in our society or those that need protection. We don't ignore all that. We don't just say, like, oh, well, one day it'll all work out and become apathetic. That's akin to hardening ourselves instead of mourning. Or justifying, defending ourselves instead of being poor of spirit. But we say, no, we press into it. And we, we go all in and we say, yeah, I hunger and thirst for righteousness too. Like I weep over this. I mourn over this. My sin in my own heart and the sin and brokenness of the world. I'm going to weep with those who weep and comfort them and sit with them and listen to them. And I'm going to trust that Jesus said, I'm going to be filled one day. And I can be filled right now in part because I experience it in part knowing that Jesus is with me and he is here and he reigns. And so I trust him in it. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. They shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. This idea of compassion and empathy and and mercy and when you demonstrate mercy then you receive it those who do not show mercy do not see it as a need for themselves those who do not think they would need help do not offer others help we see this all the time in our culture that if i don't think i would need help in your situation then i don't think i should give you help If I don't think I would need mercy there, then you also don't get mercy. The world thinks that God helps those who help themselves, if he even exists. But the reality is, God helps those whom he chooses. By his grace and his mercy. And those who know that, demonstrate mercy. Those who judge others rather than showing mercy, who demand their pound of flesh, have no choice but to cut themselves off from the mercy of God. Because they cannot receive what they have condemned. So blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We talked about a couple weeks ago about how the kingdom of God works inside out, how God cares about our hearts. Out of the overflow of the the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus says, first clean the inside of the cup, and then the whole cup will be clean. Those who are concerned about that, we talked about how that's hard, because that means we have to be transparent about our sin. We have to confess things that are in our heart that nobody else would see. Nobody else would know you're thinking that. If you don't confess that to somebody, nobody would think that you're even thinking that thought. But we say, no, I, I, I want my heart to be made clean. And so I confess the sin of my heart and I don't just settle for the appearance of holiness. And Jesus says, those who are pure in heart, they will see God. They are blessed. Those who care about how they appear will work to fix their outward appearances. And they can do that in their own strength. And when you do that in your own strength, who gets the credit for that? You. But an inside-out transformation can only be done by the Holy Spirit. Those willing to settle for just appearing holy will try to bring about the kingdom in a different way. They won't... They'll, they'll be fixated on themselves. They'll know, they'll, they'll know it's okay. Like They'll believe it's okay to compromise a little bit here or there to get your hands a little dirty over here or to appoint somebody else to get their hands a little dirty so that you do what you know is, is right in the end. But those whose hearts have been transformed by Jesus, whose appearance of holiness actually flows out of a pure heart, they will see God, and that is far better. This is one of the reasons, I think, why Jesus exalts the faith of children. Because children are perfectly pure and do not sin. Just, just kidding. Seeing if, seeing if any of the parents are still with me. I don't know. No, but there is one thing, especially in small children, is it's transparent. Their heart just confesses it all. They don't know yet how to hide those things. They learn that. 
And Jesus says, let the children, let them come to me. He says, you need to have the faith of a child, that purity of heart. And that's not something we conjure up on our own, but in that we will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. He's talking to a world that's divided. I don't know that we know anything like that. If you could possibly imagine a world where people were divided into factions and they just saw people from another faction as evil just by virtue of the fact that they were identified as this group of people. I know it's hard to imagine, but try to wrap your brain around it, okay? And so you just look at other people and you're saying like, well, because you're this, you're the problem. And Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That's a characteristic of kingdom citizens. One that does not look to fight, but to bring peace. One who acts as an arbiter, not one who chooses sides. One that seeks to understand and show compassion. Not one who seeks to just cover up everything. Be like, hey, can't we just pretend that we all get along? But one who genuinely desires peace. So it means also in the church, if someone is upset in the church because of something that is said, are you one that plays into that conflict? Who says, oh, you're right to be upset about that. Or, oh, yeah, I'd be upset about that too. Or are you one who's a peacemaker? Hey, what, what if we went and talked to that person? Does that sound like something that they would have meant? Or if they did mean it, do you think, how do you think they would respond to knowing that you were hurt by that? Let's, let's see if we can bring peace to this. That's being a peacemaker. When we act in that way, we're sons of God because we're called to proclaim the way to peace with God. And here's the thing about being a peacemaker, by the way. Nobody likes peacemakers. Tell me I'm wrong. When was the last time you like vented about something and somebody said to you like, well, hey, to try to temper it a little bit. And you said, oh, thank you for being a peacemaker in my life. It's not what you want. You want them to be like, you're right. They're evil. They're wrong. They are the problem. That's what we want in our flesh. But Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers because they are sons of God. The kingdom of the world is about choosing sides, picking the lesser of two evils, that being a good friend means bashing the enemy. But a peacemaker knows that is not the path to peace. Which is why when we're called ambassadors for Christ in Scripture, by the way, that we have given the ministry of reconciliation that brings peace with God through the blood of the cross. Like, so that we, this peace with God, this reconciliation to God, that is how we are ambassadors in living as citizens of the kingdom. How can we proclaim a gospel of peace with God when we are constantly picking fights with our neighbor? Doesn't make sense. Finally, because I'm going to combine these last two. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We talk about a state of being that we don't really want. But Jesus says you're blessed when others revile you and persecute you. Again, he doesn't say, like, just hang in there. It's going to be okay if people are reviling you and persecuting you. It's going to be okay. He says, no, you're blessed because your reward is great. It's going to be resurrected into reward, into rejoicing. The world doesn't say that. It says when you are reviled, revile back. And notice, by the way, it doesn't say anything about being persecuted for being a jerk, right? Or for being unchrist like. That is not a part of this. A lot of times, when we, especially in this country, where we don't really know the depth of persecution that a lot of other people in the world do, a lot of times when we claim persecution, it's really anything but persecution. I mean, I've seen light versions of real persecution. And let me tell you, what we experience here is, is not even close. And so when, when Jesus is saying this, he's saying, like, you're blessed when people revile you on his 
account. So let me tell you a couple of reasons, or places I have seen this. When kids are praying in their school for their classmates, who then might make fun of them, and the kids just pray more for them with humility and compassion, that's part of what he's talking about. There's some guys that I know who work on factory floors in a pretty rough culture, and they're known as Jesus freaks. And not because they have a self-righteous attitude, but because they offer to pray for their coworkers, and they are frustratingly kind and patient and gentle. Or teachers I know who humbly seek permission from parents to pray for their kids and administer to them under the radar rather than standing on a soapbox and demanding that they be allowed to just preach and pray to their whole classroom. I mean, Peter says in chapter three, 1 Peter 3, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So these are the themes, and Jesus sets this up, and you can see it echoed, the Sermon on the Mount, through all of the epistles. You see the foreshadowing of it in the Old Testament. Jesus announcing his kingdom, the way the kingdom does not make sense to the world, and the fact that it doesn't make sense makes perfect sense. And it is a challenge. The whole Sermon on the Mount is going to be a challenge, the question of do you belong to the kingdom of Jesus or the kingdom of the world? Do you believe that Jesus is better? Or do you want to turn this into some kind of morality thing for yourself or something that you can dismiss? And be encouraged if you mourn, if you grieve, if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake because your reward is great. It is a call both to the person who wants to fight fire with fire, who wants to be seen as great or even to be seen as humble or righteous, to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and seek the lower seat. And it is a call to the person who is suffering for righteousness sake that your reward is great. Those who feel poor in spirit, who cries out to God for mercy, who hungers and thirsts for that kind of righteousness to become reality in their own hearts and in the world, that they will be filled. To know that who, he who grieves over great evil in this life and wonders where God is, that you will be comforted. And every pain you suffer here will be put to death and resurrected as joy in the upside-down kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you are doing here. And Lord, I, I know that it is a fool's errand to preach your sermon. But Lord, I also know that you, you love your children. God, you love us and you're patient with us and you are kind to us. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in our hearts and for those of us who love the kingdom and have been bought by the blood of Jesus, that we would settle more and that we put our, our hope and our trust in you and how you say the kingdom is coming about and that we would be citizens of the kingdom, that we would value the things that are valued in the kingdom, that we would trust you in all these things to bring this about in us and that it would just produce more humility, more even poverty of spirit, knowing our great dependency on you. Because Lord, we are spiritually impoverished because we are needy. We do mourn, we do hunger and thirst. Help us to see that you have not forgotten us, that you are faithful to complete the work that you have started and that you are preparing a place for us and that we can experience that part and part now and someday we will experience it face to face. Lord, for those who have not yet trusted you, 
I pray, God, that you would protect them from any words that I said that would make them feel like, again, this is a list of requirements. It is not. The answer is to come to you because you are the fulfillment of all these things. You are the one who saves and redeems and transforms us. We love you. We need you. May your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven.